it, it's just for me a pure joy to take road trips. UMD Aerial Bridge and Northland Country Clubbers, the North Shore and the Skyline. I'm Kathy Warzer, and I'm the host of Morning Edition on Minnesota Public Radio and the co host of Almanac on Twin Cities Public Television, and a published author and now a filmmaker. I was having lunch with a former journalism professor from UW River Falls. And he plopped this book in front of me, the 1938 WPA Road Guide to Minnesota, and said, you know, this is a book worth reading and a book worth um, talking about. He was really enamored with the series, and it, it really is a great series, the American Guide series published in the 30s during the Depression. And I thought, well, what would happen if you were to take that book and pick a, a tour in the book, take it all the way down, and see what the book said about sites along the road and the various historical sites along the road and then see what is there years after. It really took off two years ago when the Minnesota Historical Society heard about the documentary project and said, hey, would you like to do a companion book? And that's how the book started. So I kind of call myself an accidental author because I never had plans to do that. You know, I wish I could tell you that I had some grand plan, but that would be completely incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the things I do are by a happy accident. If you open up the WPA Road Guide to Minnesota, the very first tour that they talk about in the book is Highway 61. So I thought, well, perfect. How great is that? Because it's such an iconic highway in Minnesota. <laughs> the original book is insanely detailed. You're going to fan out across Minnesota along every major highway and document history along every mile. So the, the cool thing for me is, if you look at that book, you open it, and a long mile marker, you know, 205, or take a right in 2.6 miles from that point, there's X. I mean, my God, what kind of detail? It's amazing. And I love old buildings, and I really have a soft spot in my heart for the buildings that are really decaying and decrepit. <laughs> What has been lost around, along that road really is significant, I think. Um, and just in the past three years, um, a number of buildings have gone by the wayside. I'm thinking specifically of the Two Harbors High School. It was kind of an interesting looking building. This cream colored, kind of buff colored stone building. Very pretty in its own way with that distinct kind of art modern style to it. Um, and it went kind of fell into a bit of disrepair and the Two Harbors area school district said, well, too expensive to fix up, let's just rip the thing down. Well, they built a new high school, but the old building had some really interesting character to it, especially a couple of really neat WPA murals along either side of the stage of the auditorium. Well, that's gone too. So we managed to get in there literally before the wrecking ball came and took, took some pictures. So that's gone, just an empty space at this point. What's intriguing to me, though, are the buildings that have taken on a different form. And they live, again, it's just in a different form. And I'm thinking specifically of one of my favorite sites outside of Minnesota City. It's in Minnesota City, which is outside of Winona. And it's a really nondescript, ugly machine shop at this point. Uh, but it was a really hot happening nightclub called the Oaks in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And it was one of the hot spots between here and Chicago. And I think to myself, wow, think of the great stories that are in those walls. And I could picture the big bands and the Vegas style floor acts and the gangsters that would come through and that kind of thing. And for, to me, that's really intriguing when you can, uh, when you know the history of a place that had such a colorful past, even though right now you look at it and think, oh, wow, that should be ripped down. Well, mm, that's not so fast. The, the Oaks. I was said to have these tunnels underneath it where when the heat was really on and the feds were going to bust the joint that the gangsters would run out, go downstairs and run out of these tunnels and there was a creek behind the building and they'd go out that way. Yeah, there are tunnels. They're definitely there. Um, whether they actually go all the way out to the creek, that's a little unclear at this point, but it makes a really good story. All those little tiny towns, Sturgeon Lake, um, Barnum, Moose Lake, Hinkley to a certain extent. Rush City, they're like beads on a necklace on 61. And they were all, you know, really thriving towns. And then the interstate came through. So they tell, some of these older folks tell stories about what it looked like, you know, the, how the road was just this dirt road and how, um, uh, it, how heavily traveled it was and what it was, a, it, 
the, the thrill of actually getting out in the car and traveling, what a big deal that was. It was huge. People would, you know, it was a major deal in, in the romance of that and the excitement of seeing new places. See, I love all that kind of stuff. So I want people to know about it. So if you're driving on these highways, and it could be, it could be 61, it could be Highway 52, it could be any other highway, and I'm talking not interstate, any other highway in the country, and I want people to know, yeah, there are some really neat things along this highway. You just have to get out of your car and go, go talk to people, go search for the background on some of these things. And I'm thinking of the uh, Ryden brothers. They were, uh, their family had um, a resort, gas station, um, the compound there at the Outlaw Bridge, the original border crossing on, way on the Pigeon River. And at one time, that was just a booming place. But you go there now, there's nothing there. It's like nothing ever existed. So the Ryden brothers told me about um, what it was like just how raucous it was with the border crossing and the bootlegging and and they said uh, oh we have these old home movies but I don't know what, if they're good for you or not I don't know and they used to talk about how backed up traffic would get well here on the home movies and of course the movies are this kind of shaky you know you know what I'm talking about how, when it comes to home movies and the you know the pans are really quick and they're zipping back and forth but there it is I mean there were traffic jams that went for several miles to get across the Pigeon River, you know. That was great to see. There's a gentleman, was a gentleman, Paul Gilmore, who was this country's first, one well, of the country's first silent film stars, who fell in love with the North Shore of Lake Superior. And um, he was a stage actor, and he was, and we're talking about the original silent films in the late 1890s, so he was on the ground floor of this new medium. And he was a stage actor and just dropped dead good looking and wildly popular in his day, like Brad Pitt or something. And he fell in love with the North Shore. He had hay fever. So in his older years, he came up and he built a theater on the North Shore, which is kind of by the French River now. And I thought, well, okay, I have some still pictures of Paul Gilmore. He's supposed to be a silent film star. All of his films, except one, are gone, pretty much two, actually. One's at the Library of Congress, where he was a extra in the films you have to kind of search for him the other one he funded called the Isle of Destiny and there is to the best of anyone's knowledge just a couple of copies of that film so I finagled promised begged pleaded cried and found a copy that was really awful copy and we restored it and you get to see it so it's really cool to see that I like to know how people lived I think everybody has a story everybody has a story and to record those stories, to put them on tape or to write them down, I think is really important because once they're gone, they're gone. And um, that's what I found really kind of disheartening with this particular project was I was too late in several instances. And we're talking about people in their 80s and 90s, so my time for <laughs> I have, I gotta move it along. And I, I missed out on a couple opportunities, which is too bad. There's an old cracked road sign that I have my eyes on on 61, and yeah. I just, I keep saying to myself, <laughs> leave it alone, leave it alone. <laughs>